Well, River of Life family, we're going to take a moment and come to the Lord's table. And uh, always one of the favorite parts of uh, the time together. And uh, I just want to make a comment today. When we first started the church many years ago, uh, the elders were praying and we were talking about how often to do communion. And we decided that this was not something we were going to put on the back shelf and uh, something that we wanted to do more than just once a month. And I'm glad that we're able to do this in house church as well as when we gather as a, a large group um, to worship. But I think it's important to make this central. And I've had some people say, well, don't you think having communion too often can make it common? And I think we always need to keep the cross and the message of the gospel central to our life. So let me read the words of Paul and then we'll just pray together. Uh, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I think it's a good thing for us to do that often. Also, as Paul goes on, he warns us not to take the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. In other words, not to look down on that covenant by uh, having wrong relationships, by, by sinning against body, uh, the body of Christ or the uh, brothers and sisters that are part of our fellowship. So let's just take a moment to... Uh, Align our hearts with God. Take a moment to seek Him, and I'm going to pray, and then uh, you can go ahead and stop the uh, video and go and uh, spend time together uh, with your house church, remembering all that Christ has done for us. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for the covenant that you have established on our behalf. And Lord, we know that our salvation is made secure because this was a covenant between you, God the Father, and you, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on our behalf. Lord, if this was just between us and you, we couldn't uphold our end of the bargain. But because, Jesus, you suffered and died on our behalf, you stood in for us, the covenant that we have is steadfast and secure. Lord, we are so grateful for all that you've done for us, and I pray today as we just take a moment to allow you to examine our hearts, would you speak to us if there are things that we need to confess, sins of omission, sins of commission, uh, things we've done or things we should have done. We just take a moment and ask for your Holy Spirit to search our hearts as we prepare to uh, take the, the bread and the cup together. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to River of Life Community Church. Whether you're joining us online or as a part of our house church gathering, we hope you enjoy your time with us and experience God's presence. This Wednesday, September 20th, will be our next midweek meal and service. The meal will begin at 6 p.m. with the prayer and praise service immediately following. Please let us know if you plan on attending if you haven't done so already. On Sunday, September 24th at 6 p.m., HarvestNet Ministries is sponsoring the Northeast Ohio Solemn Assembly. It will be held at Calvary Chapel, Cleveland at 709 Brook Park Road. Come out to pray for our country, our state, and spiritual awakening in all believers and churches. It is a free event, but they do ask that you register for space considerations. You can do so by emailing harvestnetministry at gmail.com. Our next in-person Sunday service here at River of Life Building will be on Sunday, October 1st, 2023. Everyone is welcome. The Ohio March for Life will be held on Friday, October 6th in Columbus. Join other Christians to boldly march for life and help educate fellow Ohioans about the dangers proposed constitutional amendment on the ballot in November. For more information, go to ohio.marchforlife.org. Thank you for your faithfulness and giving to River of Life. We pray that God will richly bless you for your generosity. Gifts can be dropped off, mailed to the church at P.O. Box 2130, Hudson, Ohio 44236, or given directly on our website or app. 
Our prayer team is always available. If you'd like to have someone pray with you, leave us a message on our website contact form. Well, that's what's happening this week. Now let's prepare our hearts for the Word. Hello, River of Life family. It's good to be back with you. Before I get into the Word today, I just wanted to pass along a word uh, from Mia Machner. She has arrived in Cannon City, Colorado, and uh, she just wanted to say thanks again to all that gave financially and those that are praying. And uh, we'll have uh, the newsletter out if you uh, want to get on her list. Uh, just let us know and we'll make sure you can do that. But let's pray that she adjusts well and uh, is able to really connect in the way that God wants her to, especially in this first couple weeks. Well, we're going to get into the Word today, and uh, we have been talking about uh, defending ourselves against the enemy and uh, how the Lord says in His prayer uh, that, Lord, deliver us from evil. So we've been really breaking down what the strategy of the enemy is. And today I want to just do a, an overview about the spiritual uh, armor that God gives us. Again, this could be another nine-month series, but I'll just do it in one day. Uh, just kind of a reminder of what God has given us. So let's pray together. Father, you have been so kind to us. Lord, you give us everything that we need for the journey. You always take care of us. You provide for us. But Lord, you also equip us with the spiritual tools. If we are paying attention, you show us what we need. I felt like last uh, two Sundays ago, I felt, Lord, like you clearly revealed some of the strategies the enemy was using against us. Today, Lord, as we take a look at the armor, would you just renew and remind us how we need to be uh, each day covered with your armor that you've given us? And Lord, continue to protect us, protect this church. Let the power of your spirit be upon us. And we do pray, Lord, that you would rise up on our behalf and that you would be our shield and defender and help us, Lord, to powerfully use the armor in these days, Lord, for protection, but also to go on the offensive according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we started uh, several weeks ago, several months ago now, by revealing the strategy of the enemy. We talked about eight arrows, uh, and we don't want to be negative by focusing on evil, but by the same token, we want to be aware and very much educated about how the enemy tries to come after God's people. Today, we're going to switch and talk about the offensive and defensive weapons, the armor that God gives us for the spiritual battle. And I just want to share a vision that God gave Colin and our, our all to get Colin Milner in our all together uh, service in September. Uh, it, while we were worshiping that day, the Lord showed Colin a mighty storm that was coming. He said it was almost like a tsunami. It was one of those uh, storms that you could see coming from a while uh, away. And um, he said there was great darkness. And then he saw pieces of armor swirling and flying in different directions. And as he shared that, I started thinking to myself, what does that mean? We're going to be talking about the spiritual armor. I think a lot of Christians have the armor, but they don't know how to wield it. They don't know how to use it. Uh, it was many years ago that the Lord gave me a picture of our church, and there was this exquisitely uh, accoutred um, soldier. He had all the war warfare weapons that he needed to win in battle, but he was standing there while the enemy was throwing things at him and hitting him with things, and the soldier wasn't using his armor, wasn't using his offensive weapons. And the, the danger is that we have these weapons, that we have this warfare, or this uh, armor, and that we're not using it. So that, there's a caution that in the storms that are coming, we need to know how to use the armor, how to wear the armor. And uh, Colin saw in the midst of this storm a tower standing strong, and it wasn't being moved at all by the storm. And the Lord told him that is the remnant that was there that was standing firm. And I believe that's a word to us. Ephesians 6 verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Again, remember the Lord's Prayer is a daily prayer. That means daily we need to put on our armor and we need to be ready to go to battle according to God's will. For obviously, in verse 12, he says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, 
against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Then Paul says it again. Verse 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with a belt of truth buckled about your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. So you may be asking, where does Paul get this whole idea of using the armor to represent the spiritual tools that God has given us to do battle against the enemy. Imagine when Paul writes this letter in Ephesus that he is a prisoner. And uh, if you look, the Ephesians, uh, book of Ephesians was one of the prison letters of Paul. During the time that he writes this, he's been recently a prisoner. For a while, he's chained to a Roman soldier. He's always got a Roman soldier in the room with him. Paul had been through this arrest, this trial, a shipwreck. And finally, he finds himself a prisoner in Rome where he's under house arrest actually for probably two years. And uh, during this time of transport, he's been chained to a Roman soldier. He actually was connected to a Roman soldier. In the midst of this all, Paul receives inspiration from the Lord about the spiritual battle. He knew the enemy was not flesh and blood. And you can follow Paul's trail of thought here. He's saying, this Roman soldier is not my real enemy. He's a threat to me now, but my real enemy are, is a spiritual battle that I'm fighting. It's the spiritual forces of wickedness. And the Lord opens up wisdom to Paul through his surroundings, the armor of his captors. And uh, so interesting that even in the midst of Paul's time of persecution, he sees himself as a prisoner of the Lord and not as a prisoner of Rome. And in the midst of this, God reveals the very revelation while he's sitting with his captor and he's observing the armor that this Roman soldier is wearing. So let's do a quick overview here. First of all, the belt of truth. The belt of truth is the word of God. And the word of God is both an offensive weapon and a defensive weapon. The belt, the truth we live in, the obedience to the truth that God gives us is the belt. The sword of the spirit, which we'll talk about in a moment, is an offensive weapon, and that's the truth we proclaim in power. The belt of truth is, is, an, uh, is defensive armor. The sword would hang upon the belt in Roman armor, and we'll put some pictures up of what Roman armor looked like. There, there have been a lot that has been preserved in archaeology, and there's some great examples here. The belt kept everything in the soldier's armor together. If the belt was not together, if the belt was not strong, the rest of the armor would not be a around him the way that it was supposed to be. In the same way, it's the truth of God and standing firm in the truth of God that secures all the armor of God in our life. If our life is not based in his truth, the rest of our armor is compromised. So truth is a life of honesty and integrity. It's a light uh, a life lived in the light of God's revelation. Uh, it's not just passive truth, but it's truth that is lived out through obedience in our lives. It's the truth that we live. It's the truth that we apply. To say something is true is not enough. This is the truth that we live. This is walking in a life of integrity. Ephesians 5.9 uh, says, We live in truth when the light of God transforms our lives. Uh, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Ephesians 5.8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So there's that truth that's part of the belt of, belt of truth. When we live in truth, when we walk in obedience to, tr to the truth of God, there's an integrity in our life. We don't have deception at work in us. And deception takes a great uh, deal of energy. If you're living a double life, if you're living a hypocritical life, uh, it, there's a lot of energy that's burned up trying to be something that you aren't. 
When you're living in integrity, the truth of God is all the way through uh, your life. Not living in truth makes us vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. It makes us um, vulnerable in a bad way, and there are doors that are open to spiritual attack. So the belt holds all the other parts of the armor in place. The second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, what does Paul mean here by righteousness? And, and by the way, the breastplate protects our, our chest, our heart, and uh, above the belt. I don't think here that Paul is talking about our justification. I believe that's what the helmet of salvation is about. That's addressed by the helmet. But this breastplate refers to our own obedience of walking in God's righteousness. God calls us to be holy as he is holy, to no longer live as we used to before we came to know him. If we love him, we will obey him. And in obedience, there is that righteousness that comes from God. I love the way that John says it in 1 John 3. He says, Dear children, let us not love with words or with tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth. We, how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. When our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before the Lord and we receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. And this is how he, we know he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. When we walk in God's love, meaning we're walking in obedience to him, we stay in his love, there's a confidence that comes into our life. There's a sense of being uh, okay in God's presence. We don't lose that uh, confidence in him. When we're living a life that's compromised and we're not in obedience to the Lord, we don't have that same integrity and uh, there's not that breastplate of righteousness in place. Romans says it this way, Romans 6.13, Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. So our righteousness, when we offer ourselves to him, when we are in submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ, he's not just our savior, but he's the Lord of our lives. We're, we're in obedience, we're referencing him. That's what is that breastplate of righteousness that protects us from the attack of the enemy. Interesting story about uh, the Roman breastplates. This is from uh, Reclaiming the Ethical High Ground by John DeFrancis. He says, during the time of the 12 Caesars, that's about 45 BC to 96 AD, the Roman army would conduct uh, morning inspections. As the inspecting centurion would come in front of each legionnaire, the soldier would strike his right fist on the armor, the breastplate that covered his heart. The armor had to be the strongest there in order to protect the heart from sword thrusts and from arrow strikes. As the soldier struck his armor, he would shout integritas, in other words, integrity which in Latin means material wholeness, completeness, and entirety. The inspecting centurion would listen closely for this affirmation and also for the ring that well-kept armor would give off. If the armor wasn't sound, it wouldn't give a ring, it would give a dull thud. How many of us have breastplates that give a dull thud when we hit it? We want that to have the ring of integrity. As the story goes, uh, later, the Praetorian or the Imperial Guard stopped uh, saying integrity when they hit their chest, and they started saying, Hail Caesar, in other words, praise to Caesar. In, re in response to that, the average legionnaires continued to say integrity, and they changed what they said to integer later. By the end of the first century, uh, they wanted to signify difference between them and the upper uh, echelon of soldiers that served only Caesar. When they shattered integrity in integer, uh, what that meant was undiminished, complete, and perfect. And it not only indicated that the armor was sound, it also indicated that the soldier wearing the armor was sound of character, he was complete in his integrity, and his heart was in the right place. His standards and morales were high. 
morals were high, excuse me. He was not associated with the immoral conduct that was rapidly becoming the signature of Caesar's Praetorian guards. So Paul saw these changes. Paul saw these soldiers. I'm sure he was thinking about that integrity when he thought about the breastplate of righteousness. When we hit our armor there, is there integrity in our life? Are we walking in obedience and, and a life that is totally uh, submitted to his lordship? The third piece of armor, uh, feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. This is a posture and attitude of preparation and availability to God. When you have your shoes on, you're ready to go. I have to tell you, I, I'm going to show you a picture here of the shoes that a, a Roman soldiers wore full of spikes. I haven't counted them all, but there's probably a couple hundred spikes on these shoes and uh, very formidable. They had strong standing, I'm sure, uh, wherever they were going in battle that day because of the, of the shoes. And it's interesting here, too, when we talk about the gospel of peace, why, why talk about peace when you're preparing for war, when you're going into, into war? I think what the Lord is saying here is as we go into war, if we have that peace with him, it's an inner peace. It doesn't come from our surroundings. The battle can be very uh, disconcerting at times. But if we have that inner peace, if we go forward into the battle in tune with him, in touch with what the Lord is saying, what the Lord is doing, there's a resolve and peace that rules our heart. I think it's the same kind of focus and uh, peace that many athletes seek before they go out for a competition. It's that focus, that single-mindedness. In our case, it means being focused on the Lord. St. John Chrysostom says that when we make peace with God, we inherit war with his enemies. So the irony here is, is when we're at peace with the Lord, we're ready to do battle with his enemies. There's a strength and a resolve that come from that peace. There's a clear mindedness that comes from that peace. It's the same kind of peace and focus that many athletes seek before competition. And I think we need to be have that same mindset of readiness, ready to go uh, when God has called us to go. He's promised us a peace that's not based on uh, the outward things of our life, because sometimes there's a lot of chaos in our external circumstances. How do you get this peace? Spending time alone with the Lord allowing God to clear your heart and clear your mind, meditating on the word, being ready to move quickly in obedience to him. That's an important thing. The fourth piece of armor is the shield of faith. We know that faith comes from hearing the word of God. And by the way, this faith is an applied uh, faith. It's an applied word. It's not just a um, written word, but it's also God's revealed word that makes our souls jump when we hear that word of the Lord for us. Uh, this is the word that gives us life and strength. Romans 10, 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. And by the way, the word there, when it says the word of Christ, is the word rhema. It's the word that means utterance. It's the spoken word as opposed to the written word. And this is the, that moment, this, this faith that comes when the Holy Spirit quickens God's word in the Bible or a word that he's giving to us, and it takes root in our heart. And, and again, if you haven't taken time to be with the Lord and to hear from him, uh, when the time comes for you to uh, raise your shield and to block the arrows of the enemy that come our way, uh, you won't be prepared. Jesus, when Jesus makes the statement, early in his ministry, and he says, mankind does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. He was talking about the word made alive. And notice when Jesus quotes that, he is in a spiritual battle with Satan, and he's saying to Satan, uh, you're using the word against me, but I have the shield. I'm using the word properly. The word is the word properly divided. It's a faith that deflects the fiery arrows of God. We need a fresh word from God daily. We need to store the word of God in our hearts and minds when we need it. This morning, I was quickened by the Holy Spirit. I've been studying the first four chapters of the book of Hebrews. And I felt like the Lord said, go get the Bible. And I want you to pray through Hebrews chapter one. And I, as I sat there and I began to pray, there are probably about nine different things that Hebrews one says that are facts about who Jesus is. 
And uh, it's amazing. He is the one that holds the universe together. God created the universe for him. Uh, he, is, he is higher than the angels. And I started praying into this and I started praising God. And the Lord said, don't worry about intercession today. I want you to lift up these things out of Hebrews 1. I felt like the Lord was giving me, he was restoring my shield of faith because as I proclaim these things, and it took about 20 minutes just to uh, read through, I would read the scripture and then I would proclaim it and uh, thank God for it. What happened is there was a strengthening that was happening in my soul. There was a confidence that was flowing into me and God was reminding me of things. That's how we prepare uh, to walk with that uh, shield of faith. God quickened his word to me and made my shield strong again. The fifth thing, the helmet of salvation. This is a, a little bit different than truth. This is the security of our standing in Christ. We don't have to walk with insecurity wondering if God will accept us today. Whether you're a Calvinist or an Arminian, I don't think God abandons people quickly and we need to understand our salvation is founded in him. Uh, when we talk about the covenant that we have, it's a covenant between God the Father and God the Son. It's two parties that have made a covenant on behalf of a third party, you and me, and that covenant between God the Father and God the Son is inviolable. It cannot be broken. It cannot be destroyed. Are you saying that a person can't lose their salvation? I actually believe that a, a person can walk away from God, but I don't think God lets that happen lightly. And I think God deals with people uh, in a very deep way. Uh, and don't even get involved in that argument, by the way. The Calvinism, Arminianism debate, I can argue both sides and we can go round and round. And I've got to tell you, I think God wants to keep us in divine tension. He doesn't want us to say, how much can we get away with or how little can we live? He's saying, live with all your heart and be strong in me. But it's based on that understanding. When we go into battle to know that God has given us a salvation that cannot be destroyed, that our standing is with him. I can't tell you how many times when the enemy has come against me and I've said, Satan, you're right. I'm hearing your accusations and I am not worthy, but I am forgiven. And I want to say this, I am not coming in my own authority. I am coming as a son of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been adopted into the body. I have been purchased by his blood and it's by the standing that I have in him, by the blood of Christ and through the cross of Christ that I stand. So take it up with him and the Lord is on my behalf. The Lord is my strength. He is the one that goes before me in battle. And that's the helmet of salvation, that confidence that we have in our salvation. It's more sure and precious than anything we can imagine. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross and his subsequent resurrection. There is power in the blood of the covenant. When you go to battle against the enemy, remind him about the blood. Remind him about that covenant. Remind him that our salvation is secure, not because of what we did, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf. And then finally, the sword of the spirit. This, by the way, is the only offensive piece of armor. Uh, unless you want to bash somebody with a shield, you can do that, I guess. But uh, it's very interesting as we, um, as we look at this piece of uh, armor that God has given us. The sword is mentioned in Ephesians and it belongs to who? The Holy Spirit. It's the sword of the Holy Spirit wielded by us. It's both offensive and defensive in nature. A sword can protect a soldier against blows of the enemy, but a sword can also be used, in to, to, used to do damage. We as the soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ need to know how to properly handle the sword that God has given us. The sword is the word of God spoken in power and authority. Jesus shows us how to use the sword. We see it in Matt, or Revelation, excuse me, Revelation 19, uh, when it says uh, the Lord appears on the battlefield at the end of time with all the nations surrounding Jerusalem, and a sword goes out from his mouth. And then it describes it. There's usually, God gives us a, uh, an image, a metaphor, and then he explains it. He says that sword is the word of God. Jesus will speak and his word will accomplish uh, destruction against the enemies of God. In Matthew 4, 3 and 4, we see Jesus wielding the sword of the word here. It says, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes 
from the mouth of God. Jesus is using the sword, but he's also talking about the sword. And he's saying to Satan, read between the lines here. Satan is quoting scripture to him. And Jesus is saying, you're wrongly in interpreting the word here. And this is the right interpretation of the word. So we need to learn to wield our sword correctly. We need to rightly divide or interpret the truth. 1 Peter 3.15, and these scriptures will be up. The notes will be up if you want to go through these in more depth. But it says, in your hearts, receive Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks, asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. When you wield the sword, be sure you don't kill the wrong enemy. I've heard people use the word and they've wiped out somebody that's not a believer. And uh, remember who our enemy is. It's Satan. It's not the people that aren't believers. So be careful how you use that sword. But also 1 Corinthians 2.12, it says, What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual reality with spirit-taught words. And those spirit-taught words, I'm going to talk more about that in a couple weeks. But I want to say this about that right now. The Holy Spirit is the one that quickens the word in us. In a moment of battle, rely, learn to rely on the Holy Spirit. If you have been in the word, if you've been with the Lord, he will bring words back to you. He will bring promises back to you. And he will help you to know how to uh, use that sword of proclaiming things against the enemy. Is it important to speak out loud in spiritual battle? I believe it is. You need to understand every invisible realm spirit that is around us, even in this room right now, there I believe there are angels. I hope there are no demons. We pray that that would not happen. But remember, people that were demonized went to church in Jesus' day. Is that true? So there's a whole spiritual realm around us that we need to be aware of. When you speak the word out loud, all of heaven hears what you say. We speak with authority if we are in Christ and we are aligned with him. And those words are powerful. And I would say this also in, in talking about the sword. Praising God with the word and truth like I did in Hebrews this morning is one of the most powerful ways that you can do spiritual warfare. Psalm 149, 66. I love this verse. It says, may the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands. So I'm not sure what the psalmist meant, but for me, that sounds like warriors in the spirit, and I love that. And then Hebrews 4.12, I'll talk more about that in weeks to come too. The word of God is active and alive, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Uh, the sword, in some ways, can even be used as a scalpel at times, actually uh, revealing the very things in our heart and our lives that need to be removed. I want to share just a final word to ROL, and I, I feel like there's a prophetic um, assignment in sharing this, and that is the Lord reminded me that our armor is not just a personal thing. Sometimes we think of our armor as what we put on personally, the Roman soldiers, the infantry, had shields that were meant to lock together. One of the amazing uh, inventions of the Roman army uh, thousands of years ago was the Roman turtle. The Roman turtle was 27 infantrymen with, with shields that locked together. And they would line up together and form a square. They would get as close as they could. The people on the sides, the front and the back would lock their shields together and then they would all drop to one knee. And then the people in the middle would take their, uh, their uh, shields and put them over their heads, lock them together with the people next to them, and they would lower them until they touched the top of their helmets. Uh, stones bounced off. It, it was so strong that there are even stories of horses and carriages going over a Roman turtle, and the people all survived with no problem. There was something about the shields being locked and being uh, connected to the ground that there was enough integrity, it almost formed a tank. And what would happen is they would drop on one knee uh, after they locked their shields, after being unsuccessfully assaulted, they would rise and surprise their enemy. The first time this was employed, 
uh, was against the Persians, from what I understand. Uh, it's very interesting. The Persians thought that the Romans had lost heart or were too tired and got down on one knee. So they came out from behind their walls and they uh, came out, they shot their arrows, and all of a sudden the Roman soldiers unlocked shields, stole, uh, stood up and won the battle that day. The interlocking shields of the Roman army made them a fearsome and undefeated force for literally generations. But the interesting thing is they had to be very disciplined. They had to be fearless. They had to be willing to stand with their neighbor and trust their neighbor as much as they trusted their own heart. Uh, they all work together in unity, and that's what made the turtle work. The discipline of all uh, working as a team became legendary in Roman circles. And this is probably what Paul was thinking when he talked about standing firm. But in the season that we're in, I had this picture from the Lord, and I felt like the Lord said, we need to lock together our shields as the enemy comes against the church. And it's not just our church. I think it's a, a lot of the church today. We need to have the kind of relationships and trust with one another, working together, listening to one another, that we can lock our shields and leave no gaps for the enemy to get things through our armor. I feel like this is an important word to us. We need to cover one another. We need to have no gaps in our defenses. And that speaks of strong, healthy relationships and working together in unity for the Lord's purpose. Father, take your word today. I know it was a, just an overview, but just to remind us again. Really, it's pretty simple when we think of the armor. The real issue is, are we going to obey you, put the armor on each day, and walk in the ways that you've created us to walk? Would you help us, Lord? Would you speak to us today? And help us, Lord, in our discussion, in our prayer time here at the end of House Church, that we could not only uh, encourage one another, but also... Uh, pray for one another in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple uh, questions here in closing today. Number one, what did the Holy Spirit speak to you today? What about the word today really influenced you? And the second thing is, how do you need to obey the Lord? What are the obedience points in being more effective in using His armor in your life right now? And then take some time to pray for one another. And let's continue to pray for families, for house churches, for leaders, for the church, and pray for our nation. God bless you.